thanks for the invitation to give this talk. Um, uh, so I've been, um, I'm a statistician. I've been working with Bayesian uh, approaches for uh, for a long time, but uh, but uh, in relation to neural networks and machine learning uh, more recently, and in particular in in connection with my former PhD students, uh, Alexander Hubin. But uh, first of all, um, congratulations for this new center. So it's fantastic that you have uh, achieved this. Um, and uh, I did have a look on your web page, and uh, I find it uh, in particular interesting that you are focusing quite a lot on the Bayesian approaches uh, to this, but also that you focus on that there is a lot of challenges uh, related to this. And this uh, I will also touch upon in, in uh, this uh, talk. Uh, so what I will do is then to start with uh, some general um, uh, uh, descriptions of, of how to do prediction in a supervised uh, setting and also related then to Bayesian uh, approaches uh, and then uh, in the end I uh, hopefully will have time to then focus a bit on, uh, on work that we have been doing. So, uh, as you already have heard uh, from uh, both Anna and uh, how uh, there is a lot of uh, settings where the predictions can be of interest, uh, and uh, of course, image analysis and uh, word uh, translation, uh, natural language processing are uh, really success stories. But there is a lot of other applications that uh, is going on as well. And uh, the typical approach is then that you have some kind of training data where you uh, and you would like to then. Uh, use this training data to then to learn some uh, some prediction function, which is a function of your input, which then would be the x is here. So uh, y is the output that you would like to predict, and x is the input that you would like to use to predict. And uh, the typical setting could be described uh, by this uh, this curve here, in that you have uh, a lot of uh, points along the x axis, which are the input and the response on the on the Y axis, and then you would like to fit some kind of curve. And then, of course, the question is then how uh, how uh, well do you do prediction, and uh, what kind of uncertainty is related to this? And it's uh, in particular this uncertainty question that uh, that I will focus uh, somewhat on. Uh, in this case, actually, the uh, the data was simulated, so the green curve is actually the true. Uh, so it does quite well in this case, but that's not stats. That's surprising, given that it's a quite simple problem with a reasonable amount of uh, observations. But in general, then, uh, assuming then that we now can describe the, our function that we want to use for prediction by some uh, set of parameters. So that would then be what we would call a parametric approach. Then uh, what you typically would do then is to use your training data to uh, to uh, estimate those unknown parameters by uh, looking at how well does these predictions fit with the actual responses you have and this fit can then be described some by some kind of loss function which could be uh, derived by a model uh, specification but could also be like least squares type of uh, of uh, uh, loss if you have uh, regression settings in mind but in many cases, and this is in particular the case when you talk about neural networks, then the amount of parameters can be quite uh, large, and you would need some kind of regularization in order to get not get an overfitting. So you would include some kind of penalty data. Uh, now there are of course many different types of loss functions that you can can use. Uh, I mentioned this mean squared, uh, no, the sum of squares for regression. You could uh, 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 look at whether you classify right or not in uh, in classification, and there is a huge range of possibilities uh, that you could actually use. Regarding the penalty term, there is also a lot of uh, of uh, possibilities, uh, and uh, if you relate it to more standard statistical approaches, then then uh, having this uh, loss function being just a sum uh, a square sum of uh, of the parameters involved, then uh, that this would co correspond to a rich or L2 type of, of regularization, and there then are variants of that which also can uh, be uh, be interesting. But this is uh, then more the standard type of uh, approaches that uh, one uses. 
Uh, regarding then this uh, this penalty term, you see that uh, I've included then some parameter lambda here, which is some kind of trade off with respect to how well do you want to fit the data compared to how much regularization you would like to have. And this is the traditional bias variance trade off in that uh, when you when you uh, have a low lambda, you would have a very complex model and you would fit the data quite well. Uh, but then the variability could also be huge. Uh, well, if you increase lambda, you can uh, uh, decrease the variability, but then you would increase the, the bias. So you have this kind of uh, uh, variance uh, bias trade-off. And what you would like to do then is to uh, choose your lambda in some optimal way, such that you minimize the uh, combination of those two uh, er sort of errors. Okay, how is this then uh, related to neural networks? Uh, in, uh, for many, uh, one thinks of, uh, of neural networks as a black box type of uh, modeling where you don't, re uh, where you are in some sense in a non parametric setting, uh, or at least in a very uh, uh, flexible uh, setting where you don't make uh, strong assumptions about uh, your function. So, uh, how does that then fit with uh, the parametric approach? Well, um, first of all, uh, describing then the neural networks uh, can be useful here and that you have on the bottom here the input variables. And what you do then is that you combine those in some uh, linear way, take a nonlinear uh, 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 transformation, and then you uh, uh, obtain some uh, latent variables, which then are used to do, to do prediction. And uh, what you need to do then with the fit is to uh, is then to estimate the weights that you put on all these uh, uh, these arrows. But uh, an important uh, thing to notice here then is that this uh, description of a neural network is actually a parametric uh, formulation, in that the all these latent variables sets are specific functions of the input with some weights and some bias term here. And similarly for the last relationship, is if you look at, on a regression, it would be also a specific nonlinear transformation of a linear combination. And by looking at it in this way, then you actually have a parametric form. It is a quite complex parametric form, but still parametric. And uh, the parameters involved then are all the weights going from, uh, from the input to the middle layer and to the output. As, uh, so there could be quite a lot of parameters if you have many, uh, many hidden layers or, or man, and many hidden nodes. Now, if you go to deep learning, you would have many hidden layers uh, and the number of parameters would explode. But the principle is still the same uh, in that you can write it down as a mathematical uh, uh, model with some parameters involved. Now, uh, the, uh, the real uh, benefit in doing this uh, in a, a neural network setting is that this actually gives a very flexible class of uh, functions f, which in principle can approximate any function you want uh, by just uh, including either enough, uh, enough uh, hidden uh, nodes or enough uh, layers. And actually, uh, uh, you might then perhaps ask, why do you need more than one uh, uh, layer if you can actually approximate everything by just one layer and enough nodes? Well. Actually, uh, several nodes can give better, better approximation with fewer parameters. So there is a gain in also doing that. Now, there is a lot of ways you can do this, uh, and there are many different types of nets. But in this talk, I will, uh, I will uh, concentrate on, on simple settings with just one layer in order to illustrate the, uh, the ideas. But then everything can be transferred to more general settings. Okay, but uh, going back then to the uh, to uncertainty. So if we have some input, uh, new input x star, uh, which we have observed, then what we do is to make a prediction based on then uh, our estimated f function. 
Uh, and there are actually two questions then. How accurate is F itself? But also how accurate is the, uh, is the prediction? And those actually can uh, be, uh, be quite different. And uh, it's not always uh, that easy to uh, quantify each of these sources. And in many cases, you only, uh, you in some sense, ignore the uncertainty in the F and only look at the uncertainty in, uh, in Y given F. So, uh, but it is important to include all sources of, uh, of uncertainty. Also, with you, if you work with neural networks, as in all other type of uh, uh, model-based or, uh, or, uh, or more machine learning type of uh, predictions. And that's where uh, Bayesian analysis comes into play. So this is uh, ideas of you doing that within neural networks has uh, existed for, uh, for a long time. It is an alternative to, uh, to uh, frequentist analysis. And as also uh, Anna mentioned in the beginning, the, uh, the framework is that you include some uncertainty about your model. So if your model is that you describe the data by this F function, what you actually do is then to introduce a model for the functions themselves. And what you then do is that you use Bayes' theorem to update your knowledge about uh, this F uh, by taking the data into account. And this is, in principle, uh, an easy thing to do, but in practice can be quite difficult. And it is difficult uh, on two, two levels. One is in the specification of the prior. So how should one actually say something about uh, our prior knowledge about uh, how these functions will appear? But also there's a numerical uh, issue in that uh, even though this formula doesn't look too complicated, in particular this integral uh, is uh, quite, uh, quite uh, complex to, uh, to deal with in, in practice. But if you are able to do this kind of uh, calculations, then you can perform also prediction. As, uh, and this is the same formula as uh, Anna uh, presented in the beginning, where you then, uh, instead of just imputing your best guess of, uh, of your function, you actually take into account the uncertainty in, uh, in that uh, function by uh, integrating over all possibilities. So it's mainly a weighted average, where, you, uh, where you, uh, the weights of the average is uh, related to how much you believe in that specific function. So this is a general framework, but it simplifies somewhat if you can assume that your function is uh, described by some parameters, as we could in the neural network setting. Because in that case, instead of trying to uh, construct a prior for a uh, for a set of functions, which can uh, be quite difficult, you now uh, can reduce the problem to construct priors for the parameters involved. And that is typically much easier. And, uh, uh, but then the procedure further is the same in that you uh, have some prior information then on the parameters and you update it by base zero. And you can do predictions in the, in the same way. Of course, you could ask why would one do uh, go for this Bayesian approach? Because it is much more difficult uh, and it has some uh, disadvantages. Uh, I mentioned that the, uh, it is very computational demanding, much more so than, uh, than the more standard uh, uh, applications of neural networks. And also it is difficult and it might be even subjective uh, to uh, how you specify these priors. So, uh, so these are drawbacks with the Bayesian approach, but there are also some advantages and that's uh, why uh, people would in many cases prefer to use it. Uh, and that is, it's, uh, it has a, a formal way of mathematically describing what you actually uh, are perhaps are doing in practice and in any case, taking into account the uncertainties that uh, are involved. Uh, 
and uh, you can um, you can, for instance, uh, look at uh, variances which you uh, uh, can directly obtain through uh, through uh, some integration and over the posterior distribution, as we call it. And even though it might be difficult to specify price, you then open up the possibilities for including expert knowledge uh, if that is available. And there is a flexibility of using many alternative problems. Okay, so how is this then in, uh, in uh, Bayesian neural networks? Well, uh, remember again that uh, you have a, more, a specific mathematical description of a neural network. So it is some kind of function, a complex function, including some parameters, where the parameters then are all these weights that goes into the neural network. What you need to do is then to specify a prior on uh, on your uh, uh, on all the parameters, and uh, at least for most applications that were uh, that I've seen, those priors are quite simple uh, in the sense that uh, you typically perhaps would split it up in uh, uh, in just looking at marginal priors for each parameter uh, uh, by themselves. Uh, uh, so you assume some kind of independence, um, which then simplifies uh, things considerable. Uh, this is certainly not uh, a reasonable prior. You wouldn't, you wouldn't really believe that all of these weights uh, are independent. But uh, in many cases, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, done uh, for computational convenience. That said, there is a lot of uh, activity now uh, going on. Uh, to uh, to uh, construct more uh, reasonable priors, uh, um, but uh, but this uh, even increases the computational efforts even further. So um, so you would then uh, apply this type of uh, prior, and then uh, you can go through Bayes theorem and do uh, the computations uh, involved. Right, and uh, just uh, I won't go into detail at all on uh, on how to do the uh, computation. It is quite involved, but there are essentially two uh, two uh, approaches uh, for doing that. One could be to base it on Monte Carlo simulations, so uh, in particular Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Uh, that is in uh, typically quite uh, computer intensive. Um, but at least it's possible for small networks. But what one uh, typically is doing then uh, for larger networks is, uh, is uh, to uh, go to some kind of uh, approximation where, uh, called vari variational inference, which is much faster uh, and works quite well in the sense that if uh, you look at point estimates, then they are quite accurate. But it does underestimate uncertainty. And that actually is uh, some kind of problem because uh, the reason for doing Bayesian analysis in the beginning was exactly to inc uh, take into account uncertainty. So, uh, so uh, it is uh, a bit problematic that you that you uh, are not uh, able to really take into account the uncertainty uh, as you uh, uh, as you would, but it do give. Uh, better uncertainties than if you uh, did a more uh, frequentist type of approach. So there is an improvement, but not uh, fully. And it actually could be quite interesting then to, uh, to do what uh, the previous uh, speaker said to then uh, try to uh, calibrate that uh, afterwards. Uh, it's a, a very interesting approach. Okay, but then um, prior knowledge. Uh, so, what kind of prior knowledge would we actually uh, typically have? Uh, that, of course, depends on applications, but uh, there are some perhaps general type of uh, features that you uh, could build in. So, one, for instance, is that you would perhaps expect that your function is quite smooth in some way. Uh, you would perhaps assume that it's sparse, 
in that not all the uh, input variables and perhaps not all the in, uh, latent nodes in the neural network would be uh, uh, have the same importance. So uh, you would perhaps like to remove some of those. Even though you don't know which of them that are uh, important, you would uh, you would perhaps imagine that it's not a large amount of those that are important. And you would also perhaps uh, like that there is uh, uh, emphasize that most simple relationships are perhaps more reasonable than complex ones. That might again depend on applications, and in particular for image analysis, that might not be the case because uh, because uh, images are quite complex uh, uh, things to deal with. And then also you would, uh, of course, expect that your output would depend on some combination of different factors, and this might also then be uh, be uh, described in some kind of hierarchical structure as you do in neural networks. Uh, another thing is that you would typically perhaps have a combination of some vague uh, information and then more precise. Uh, so in some cases, you perhaps would make some hard constraints on your model. And in all the cases, you would have some soft constraints. You would like to, uh, to uh, combine that in some way. Uh, as was also mentioned earlier, um, uh, and uh, another advantage with uh, this um, this Bayesian approach is that uh, overfitting is also in some sense taken into uh, to account. But as I also mentioned, even though we would like to construct some complex price, in practice we are using quite simple uh, simple ones, and then the main gain is uh, probably on the uncertainty level. Okay, um, Anna, how much time do I have left now? So that you can you can use uh, uh, five ten minutes. Right. Okay, that uh, should be sufficient, I think. So now I will go uh, more into uh, some specific uh, uh, work that uh, me and my former PhD student have been uh, working on, and that is. In some sense, to, uh, in the first part, to try to simplify the uh, network, and uh, the main idea can perhaps be best illustrated by this uh, uh, by this uh, network uh, uh, displayed here. In that, uh, while uh, in many uh, approaches you have a very dense uh, network, so there will be arrows for any of the x's in the bottom here to any of the immediate. Uh, sets in the middle uh, hidden layer and similarly from the y to the, uh, to to the uh, from the set to the response y uh, but uh, what you perhaps would uh, like is to uh, make uh, give a data driven approach to simplify this structure so some of these arrows uh, would perhaps not be important to include and those you would like to uh, to um, to remove. And one way of doing that within the Bayesian approach is to include in the model some binary variable, which is uh, called the uh, gamma here, which is either zero or one. And if it is zero, then you turn off that arrow. So then you get a, a simpler uh, type of network. And note that uh, this is quite similar to the uh, to the dropout uh, method that has been quite popular uh, for many years. But uh, while the dropout method is more a tool for uh, simplifying the training part, uh, in this approach we actually include then the sparsity in the model part. So we actually do assume that the network is sparse which is in contrast to the, to the dropout, which uh, in the end typically use as a dense network again. So, uh, so this is uh, then uh, one uh, approach one, that can, one can uh, take. Uh, and uh, given then the framework of, uh, of uh, the Bayesian uh, analysis, you can then uh, use the data to learn these parameters. Uh, and in particular, learn then uh, which ones should be turned off and which ones should be turned on. Uh, 
Um, also in this case, you would need some uh, a prior, but now a prior including then also these binary variables. And that uh, requires uh, somewhat more sophisticated computational algorithms, which is much more computational expensive than, uh, than the Bayesian approaches uh, for dense ne neural networks. But what you then gain uh, is, is something like this. So this is the uh, perhaps much too used uh, MNIST uh, data set. Uh, but uh, it is easy to, uh, to illustrate uh, how it works. Um, so in this case, we have uh, looked at a neural network with three hidden layers, um, uh, with uh, 400, 600, 600 uh, um, nodes within each of these layers. This is, of course, not the optimal type of, uh, of uh, uh, network to use, but it's mainly for illustration. And uh, what we obtain in this case is that by using then this, uh, this way of, uh, of then removing some of the, uh, of the uh, weights or the links between different nodes, we actually achieve a quite considerable reduction in the model structure, in that uh, for uh, for the uh, for the weights going from the input to the first layer, we only need about five percent of the uh, of the weights, and similar from the uh, first hidden layer to the second hidden layer, and then somewhat more for the for the last layer. And that we obtained without losing any uh, uh, any uh, accuracy in the in the classification in the end. So uh, so we can get a simpler model with the same kind of accuracy. So that was one uh, approach that we have been working on. Uh, another uh, framework, uh, which uh, again is uh, uh, is perhaps easiest to illustrate with the uh, with the plot uh, on the bottom here. Uh, so again, we have the uh, the input uh, variables uh, in the bottom, and we have the output in the top, and we have some hidden layers. But what we do here uh, is to uh, uh, to extend the uh, the uh, standard neural networks in. Uh, well, three different ways. Uh, one is the same as before, that we allow for some of the arrows to be removed. Uh, the other is uh, that you allow uh, some connection from, for instance, the first layer directly to the output. This is very similar to residual ne uh, ne neural networks. Uh, so that is also something that uh, has been used quite a lot. But the third thing uh, is that we allow for different type of transformations. So uh, the colors here correspond to different functions that we are using for transformation. So it could be a sigmoid transformation, it could be a log transformation, exponential uh, function, or, uh, or anything uh, like that. And the, uh, the, what you gain by doing that is that you actually, if there is a simple function that describes the uh, relationship between the input and the output, so you actually perhaps don't need all these intermediate uh, um, uh, nodes, then the procedure actually can find it. So it searches, uh, it's, it's doing a quite considerable model search by looking at many different combinations and then try to select those that, uh, that uh, explains the data as good as possible. And, uh, uh, and just to uh, illustrate uh, what, how one could use this, this is actually then to in some sense try to confirm a physical law. So there's a lot of measurements on, uh, on planets uh, and Kepler's law is saying something about the relationship between different uh, variables here. So in particular, if you look at this uh, A, which then is the well, same, same Meyer X axis uh, uh, something, then that can be uh, described uh, by this function. Now, the point is that we throw away this knowledge. So we actually don't know, uh, we assume that we don't know this, but we would like the method to actually recognize this function, which, uh, but by searching then through all kinds of combinations that we could include here. 
And uh, at least for this example, it actually, uh, by including a lot of different types of transformations, then it was, uh, was able to, uh, to recognize the right model by, uh, with uh, a very high probability. Now, this data is quite special because, uh, because uh, uh, the data actually follow this model quite closely. So uh, you might argue that this is a, is a, a somewhat simple uh, problem, but it, uh, but it illustrates the potential. And by that, I, I then will just uh, finish uh, by saying that uh, um, the Bayesian approach both have um, uh, uh, um, a great potential in taking uncertainty into account, although I haven't illustrated that much here, uh, but also that you can include a lot of prior expert knowledge and, uh, and the typical prior knowledge that we have included in our work is mainly sparsity and uh, to uh, have different types of functions that you could uh, include. And it typically is robust to overfitting and it can lead to quite sparse structures by uh, uh, reasonable uh, priors. So uh, there is, of course, a lot of challenges uh, in that uh, you have to choose the priors and, and so on and introduce some subjectivity and uh, the choices they are very much too simple so i would really i'm really interested to follow what you are able to do in in your sfi uh, version so perhaps we'll stop there with some references thanks